Hello, regulars. You're listening to Floor by Floor, a Tower of God podcast discussing the latest chapters of the webtoon. I'm Viralene. And I'm Rizyat. And we're your hosts. Welcome to the eighth floor, where we'll be discussing chapter 573, or season 3, episode 156. But first, we'll start with a recap of the previous chapter. It started with Kuhn standing at the family head's doorway and asking Tramare to make a deal with him. Tramare is open to listen to what Kuhn has to say, as long as it's what the Irregular wants. If it's nonsense, he will drop Kuhn into the Lopobia battleship's Grand Aquarium, which recently had a hungry creature released into it. Kuhn tells him no one wants the marriage to happen, so in their stead, he offers Tramare a game. If he wins, he wants Tramare to call off the wedding and let them go. Tramare says no, and he'll be dropping Kuhn into the aquarium. Kuhn tells him to wait, and pulls out his personal chessboard. He asks him to play speed chess with him, and if Tramare wins before the gate closes, he'll give up. But if he manages to hold on until then, to let them go. Tramare asks him why he should give Kuhn the honor of playing with him when he has nothing to gain from it. Kuhn says if Tramare wins, he will cooperate in helping him find out who the traitors are. Tramare thinks about it, and agrees to his game. He adds that the traitor is a family affair, and he will capture them no matter what. If Kuhn interferes, then the match is forfeit. Kuhn agrees. The game starts two minutes before the gate opens. We do a POV switch to when the pocket reads 35 seconds left until the gate opens. Bomb is urging Yuri to run for the gate. The Snake Master is asked to assist, and snakes fly towards Tiara the monster. We cut back to Kuhn making small talk with Tramare. Kuhn says he doesn't understand why the great families are fighting when things used to be so peaceful. Why can't they just stop the war and get along as they used to? Tramare responds that it's impossible. Kuhn assesses that Tramare is not behind the start of the war. Kuhn continues stalling by commenting on how the princesses are also escaping out the gate. If they are going that far to avoid marriage, shouldn't Tramare as their father reconsider? Also, why does Tramare want Bomb as his successor so badly that he turned a jihad's princess into a bride? Bomb is a lot stronger, but he is not strong enough to defeat a family head. What role could he possibly want for him? Tramare calls him out for asking pointless questions. But Kuhn keeps rambling, saying Popadal Gustang also wants Bomb, and that's why he was sent there. He tells Tramare about the strange book he saw, and how Gustang told him the history they know is false. He asks Tramare who Icarus is, and Tramare says he can't recall such a name. Kuhn is playing defensively to buy time, but his defense is being crushed. We cut back to Bomb, Rock, and Yuri, running as the snakes launch themselves towards Tiara the monster. With 15 seconds left, the snakes wrap themselves around Tiara, and Tiara starts to panic. She struggles to move forward, but the snakes are overpowering her. The gate opens, and a warp ship comes through. The pocket timer resets to three minutes until the gate closes. Shilio, Lilio, Bomb, Rack, and Dravi race up the stairs towards the warp ship, but Bomb stops at the top step. Rock asks him what's wrong, and Bomb says Kuhn and Endorsi are not here yet. Rock yells that they will come and for him to not be so slow. Bomb listens for once and enters the warp ship. With two minutes left, Yuri tells everyone to go ahead. She will hold off Tiara the monster as best as she can until the gate closes. One minute and 31 seconds remain, and Yuri unleashes her full power with dual needles, but the attack goes right through Tiara's Shinsu monster body. Yuri falls back into the portal just as Tiara's massive mouth closes around it. Tiara returns to her human form in front of the portal. The timer shows 45 seconds left, and Tiara thinks that she still has time to go through the portal. She stops suddenly, as she feels an ominous aura coming from the family head's room. Matt shows up and asks Tiara if she's okay. Tiara answers that she is, and that they're leaving. We cut the trauma ray saying checkmate. The gate is still open, so he's won. The wedding will proceed. Trauma ray steps out of the room and freezes. The lobby is empty. The gate is closed. Kuhn comes up behind him, saying he isn't imagining things. Before the chess game ended, the gate had already closed. Tramare asks about the leftover time, and Kuhn admits he lied. The gate opened at the start of the game, and Bomb and company should have left immediately. The lighthouse feed was delayed by two minutes in order to distract Tramare from what was happening outside. His actual win condition wasn't to last five minutes, but to not lose until the gate closed. He lost the chess game, but he didn't lose Bomb. Tramare calls him a fool. The traitor would be caught whether he won or lost. 
He already knows who the traitor is, and he was informed about the escape plan. He only let them go in order to see the traitor's movements. While he was preoccupied with the match, two branch family heads were dispatched to capture the traitor and his friends. If Kuhn interferes, the match is forfeit. If he doesn't, they can't escape. It's another checkmate. Tramare admits he only played along for his own entertainment. He enjoyed watching him try to escape, scheme, and lie, all to fail. Kuhn thinks to himself that Tramare is the most twisted person he's ever seen. And that's the end of that chapter. And the action continues into this week's chapter, where we pick up immediately where that left off. We open with Tramurai telling Kuhn he won't gain anything. There was never a chance Kuhn could win. He already knew there was a traitor long ago. Kuhn yells if he already knew, then why did he... And Tramurai cuts him off, saying that there was no threat from someone so insignificant, and compares them to chess pieces, knights that could never catch the king. If he baits the traitor, he can use them to his advantage. How did Jinsung find the battleship's location and share it? How did Pobidao members get inside the battleship in the first place? The answer is easy if he uses them. Kuhn thinks he's been caught. Tramurai figured out that Jinsung and the traitor were working together, and now Baum and company are in danger. We time skipped to a few minutes ago on the other side of the gate that Baum and company have crossed. Yuri pops out of their side of the gate. She tells him to get going before the family head or Tiara chase after them and things get messier. They run down the catwalk but stop once they see Goruro. Shilil is surprised to see the lizard branch family head. He introduces himself and calls himself the insider who will help them escape, then tells him to quietly get into the submarine. From above, the two family branch leaders who Tramurai sent look down on them, the badger branch head, Lopobia Umtiri, which is a pretty funny name, expresses his disappointment in Gororo. Gororo cries out, Brothers! The grey wolf branch head, Lopobia El Baba, goes on to say that Kirin trusted Gororo enough to appoint him as a security commander for the battleship, to think that he was the traitor. Gororo asks him how he found out, and El Baba says Kirin told them. Did he think the family head wouldn't know just because he stays in his room all day? Tramurai knows he's the traitor and that he's been talking with Fug. Albaba then orders their beasts to destroy the submarine and the beasts leap down. Goruro urges Baum and company to hurry up and get inside the submarine. Yuri thinks to herself that she can't fight even if she wanted to because she can't touch the family head or her situation will get worse. The grey wolf beast snarls and Cha punches it in the snout. Bomb recognizes Cha, who suddenly popped out of nowhere. Gororo then kicks the badger beast on the chin to keep it away. Cha keeps his promise to Jinsung and tells Bomb that Jinsung has escaped first, so he should go quickly. Suddenly, there's a rumbling and everyone stumbles. A massive turtle shows up from underneath them. Shilio points out that the other branch leaders are here too and that this is a trap. Goro yells, why are they not getting on the submarine? And Liliel tells him they might as well be getting into coffins at this point. Goro brushes it off, and Liliel tells him if he's going to help, he better do it right. In the middle of this, we cut to Tramurai telling Kuhn that he never trusted anyone on the battleship, even his own children. And since he trusts no one, he's never been betrayed. What kind of technicality is that, Tramurai? What? He calls everyone's insignificant beings who mean nothing to them, them being the family heads. We cut back to Cha saying that the regulars should get on the submarine first and that the others will open up the way. He throws a primal punch at the grey wolf beast as Goro opens his mouth and unleashes a multitude of tiny, six-legged lizards. The lizards cover the badger beasts as it struggles to shake them off. Then suddenly, inexplicably, Bong Bong appears and Kun and Dorsey pop out. Kun shouts that they're in trouble. The family head is coming. But Bomb cuts him off to warn him of the danger below them. The massive turtle's head rises up and takes a chomp out of the catwalk, just as Kun and Dorsey dodge. Kun tells Dorsey to ready the Bong Bong when his spear flies towards his back. Kun throws up a shield, but the spear is seen cracking through it. Bomb and Rock reach out to Kun. And there's a moment where Kuhn really thinks he's going to die. Again. Right then, we cut to Tiara and Matt running through the garden next to the hotel. 
Matt, still in his concrete form, asks Tiara if they're really withdrawing like this. Escaping the battleship won't be easy, and the Slayer candidate will end up in the Lopobia hands. Tiara says that it's the family head's orders that if it becomes difficult to obtain their target, make sure that the tackle man, referring to Kuhn, and the target is stay together and escape. She's sure the target and tackle man are in the same location, so they need to focus on escaping. The family head must have some sort of plan. And a plan he does have, because we suddenly come back to Kuhn's lighthouse glowing brightly, whose stong pops out from it and he disintegrates the spear. He says he knew he'd be able to trust Kuhn to be by Baum's side at the most critical moment. Everyone is shocked to see Gustang. Gustang says that he came over twice to play already, but hasn't been able to see his friend's face both times. He tells the family branch heads to tell Traumerite to come out, or else he'll take everything for himself. And the chapter ends right there, with one friend asking another friend to come down here and throw hands. That would be a great time to get the heck out of there. Stuff's gonna blow up. Or we're going to get a very interesting, very calm conversation in front of a manatee submarine. Hmm. Oh, sure. They're just going to have a nice talk to negotiate over bomb. That's definitely going to happen. <laughs> if we get more funny bomb faces out of it, I'm game. <laughs> it's really interesting that Gororo is the lizard branch head. He spits out lizards from his mouth like a little bubble machine. They just fly out everywhere. That was so funny. Badge is just like, no, as he's covered in a whole bunch of lizards. I'm more confused about where exactly did they come from inside of him? Or did he just summon them and the summoning portal happens to be in his mouth? Because it must not be easy to talk with lizards in your mouth. Maybe it's just some funky Shinsu thing. I mean, Ren had a giant leech in him. You saw how long that thing got. And it came out of his palm. So somehow they have some hammer space in there. Just full of lizards. Lizard time space. If you pop Gororo, it just explodes into lizards. Oh no. What caught my attention here was Gororo explicitly wondering what Kieran's actual intentions are in this chapter. And... We're not really given too much more context to that thought. It's just a thought bubble there in the middle where Umtiti and El Baba were just accusing him of, oh, you're a traitor, how disappointing. And then he just wonders what Kieran is up to. Huh. What do you think of the possibility of Kieran playing two hands here? Traumarai says he never trusted anyone, not even his own children. Do you think he's aware of Kieran's perception of him? I bring this up because I've mentioned before that there's been discussion about Kieran possibly wanting to get the old Traumerai back, since he's been somewhat disgruntled with the current Traumerai. He's also directly asked Traumerai about the Leviathan, and Traumerai dodged the question. Is it possible that Kieran isn't really even a traitor, but making some moves in the shadows to ensure Traumerai is somehow exposed to the Leviathan again? It definitely seems like he's loyal to Traumerae at the moment, but for how long? Part of his backstory is that he's been around Traumerae and has been his underling since the time when the Great Warriors were all climbing the tower. When they hit the 101st floor or something like that, they had to fight a demon lord for a floor test. And apparently this demon lord was Kirin's father. And Traumerai took to Kirin and just found his species interesting and made him his underling. So he's been there for a very long time. He's been able to see how Traumerai has changed over time, especially before he dumped his memories into Leviathan and now after. I feel like if you didn't really agree with how someone changed after time, you might want to do something about it. And so, a possible like theory this is pure theory crafting a possible train of scheming is this and who knows maybe trauma is aware of this anyway we will see imagine this what if kieran helped gororo and the boss with their plot either as a genuine ally or as an undercover agent to expose them he then helps them recover the snake branch's flute 
He helps the boss infiltrate the frozen waterfall, the giant suspendium at the nest, which ends with the release of the Leviathan. Kieran leaks the coordinates of the Lopopiao battleship to Jinsung through a network, and it makes its way to the Popidao as well. Kieran then warns Chamurai of the existence of a traitor, probably sets up Goro as a chess piece for Chamurai to knock out, and lays solid proof with Jinsung openly admitting he deduced the coordinates and sent info out to people to interfere with the marriage competition as part of the plan to make that credible. Then Chamurai gets the Snake Master involved because of its relations to the Lizard Branch and asks Bomb to kidnap Laura to make the traitor spur into action. And during this mess, Kieran refuses to send help to Jam Jam to enable interference to occur and leaves him for dead. And that leaves us to where we are now, with Traumarai coming into the picture, with Gustang there in person, and Bomb is conveniently right there. The Leviathan's so close. It's so close! And Traumarai's like, I'm going to use Bomb against Gustang in this war. Like Gustang is right there, Bob is right there. Are we going to see some Leviathan action? Are they finally going to like sit there and talk and give us like a whole nice little lore dump for us poor readers who have been trying to figure out where the heck this is all going? It's just a very spicy, logical train of thought, and it'd be interesting to see what's actually happening. I just want them to sit down and talk at this point, and probably explain my one little nitpicky thing about this chapter. Kunin and Dorsey suddenly appeared out of nowhere with no explanation. One moment, we just have Bomb and company running for their lives and suddenly, poof! Kun just runs in like, Bomb! Stuff's happening! You need to run! You won't believe what just happened. It's like, no, we don't because we didn't see anything. My thought is that it's probably a future gotcha plot point that might get explained next week or soonish. Like, how did Kun get away from Chamurai? Where did Dorsey come from? Did Chamurai just stick true to his words and let them go because anything they do is inconsequential to him? So it doesn't even matter if they just walked away at that moment? Or perhaps did Kuhn somehow cut another deal? I doubt it, but what happened there? Will we even ever get an answer? Hopefully when Chamurai shows up, he'll give us an answer. I hope so. And then the major thing that happened this chapter. The fandom went crazy over this one, at least over in the Twitter circles. Kuhn Bomb's separation is one thing, but Kuhn death is a whole other mess. Once again, the blue man evades the scythe by mere centimeters. And how did this happen? Because Gustang realized Kuhn Bomb are a package deal that should never be separated. A lot of people are saying that Gustang is the true Kuhn Bomb shipper. He steps in at the last second, saves Kuhn from certain death at the end of a trident, and then just goes on to say, I knew you were up to the task, that you would be by his side at the most critical moment. Please, the Pope Dao are fanfic writers. But during that little interchange, something else also popped out at me. Gustang referred to Kuhn by you. Like referring to him as an actual person instead of some insignificant creature like Chamurai does. Gustang might call people bugs and vermin, and Chamurai may call people insignificant creatures. But unlike Chamurai, who just dismisses anything below him, Gustang seems to harness the power of regulars and actively tries to do something with them instead of just completely disregarding them. For him to see Kuhn in a different light and actually put some value in him, that's kind of cool. It also makes him a lot more dangerous if you really think about it. Because it gives him a lot more pieces for him to play with. A lot of people have been speculating how this Gustang versus Traumarite fight is going to go. Well, we'll find out soon, hopefully. But they're thinking that Gustang has the upper hand because he's willing to use regulars rather than dispose of them. Man recognizes the importance of resources. Traumarai seems to want to do everything by himself or deems himself untouchable. And as we know from past tropes, that never goes well. It's all coming to a head. Him having been capturing these races, subjugating them, treating them worthlessly. Little playthings that don't do anything, merely serve for his entertainment. 
his comeuppance may come soon, or something happens that changes him. A popular trope here that could be applied would be the idea that perhaps Traumarai was more of a gentle person before he abandoned all of his memories and fed them to the Leviathan. Maybe he was someone completely different, and having shed all of these memories and whatnot turned him into this emotionless guy at the top. But once again, who knows? And maybe we'll find out soon. Do you think Traumarai was expecting Gustang to show up here? I mean, he must know he was gonna show up at some point. He has been coming to visit him multiple times. The Traumarai just keeps hiding in his room. People. Ugh. Guests. Ugh. Such a hassle. All these kids showing up trying to play chess with him, destroying his hotel, all these people plotting behind his back. It's just not peaceful around him right now. Not at all. But by extension, if Chamurai knew, that would mean Jihad knew. And that would mean that, yes, definitely, this is all predetermined and is going to follow a set route. Chamurai told Jahad that he was planning to use the irregular against Gustong to point the thorn at Gustong's throat instead of Jahad's. So, seeing as the chances of this going haywire is incredibly high, would Chamurai plan to use bomb against Gustong right at this moment? So when you think about it, where the hell is Jinsung? What is he planning? Is he going to show up at a bad time to cause a disaster? And I still have this weird feeling that Mishenia is somehow involved in all this, too. Because why did she get Bomb to get the Leviathan if not for having some sort of plan in this? But we don't know. Once again, we're just left with more questions than answers. But it's seemingly like we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Like we're actually going to get some answers. We're also going to get a million more questions, but, you know, answers. It definitely feels like the story is building and building and building and we're just waiting for it to all come down. Well then, if Chamurai shows next week, this next chapter is going to be absolutely spicy and I am looking forward to it. The hype is very high right now. The fandom does seem very active right now. We can't wait. Well, regulars, that does it for this week. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you on the next floor. Goodbye. Have a good one.